whatever your children call you, daddy or dad or poppy or pops or whatever it is that they call you and grandpop and pop up and, and um, all the spiritual fathers in the house. Thank you, Pastor Ralph. Thank you for me, my spiritual father. <laughs> Hallelujah. But I want to tell you that fathers are critically important to our society. Fathers are critically important to the raising of our children, to the raising even of our grandchildren in some cases, to the running of our homes, to being, uh, being the, the head of the household and leading the children and leading the, the home and leading the wife. It's critical in this day and age. I'm so perturbed and bothered by hearing the stories of men that are quick to make a baby but not hang around to raise the baby. Okay, I'll come to this side. I'm really sick and tired of hearing stories about men who are quick to make a baby but won't hang around to take care of the baby. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, let's, listen, when I talk to you, I'm looking for the real people. Where are the real people in the house? I'm not looking for the religious folk. I'm looking for the real people that know what I'm talking about. Hallelujah. And it's about time. I'm talking to the men. And listen, women and moms, I love you. You're amazing. Mamas, you are amazing, and we appreciate you. I've got the best mama in the world, and I love her, and she's amazing. But fathers, it's time to step it up. It's time to step it up and get serious about this. And just, uh, Pastor Ralph mentioned it a little bit ago. Uh, I am a father. I'm a father of four men now. They're not boys anymore. My oldest, believe it or not, David, is 31. It's going to be 31. And my youngest, Genesis, somewhere in the house here, is 21. And, and then in between, I got a 29 and a 23-year-old. And on top of that, the awesome thing is I've got six grandchildren. I got four baby girls, and I got two baby boys. Now, they're not ba nine years old, the oldest, two years old, the youngest. And I got the privilege and the honor and the joy of having uh, one of my granddaughters, Maya, live with me because my son lives with me. And I gotta tell you, I raised four boys. It's hard to raise a little girl. They are so different. She is so emotional and dramatic. Oh my goodness. Just, just even this morning, in between services, I go home just to see what's going on and she's there and you know we play this little game and she's hiding and whatever. She finally sits at the dining room table to eat her breakfast and she, she, she has her own little table. You know what I'm talking about? She has her own little thing. But she was at the big table this time. And we took her little mats that we have on her little table. She, we put it on the big table to clean them. Well, all of a sudden, across the table, she goes, Pop up. What? Why did you steal my mats? And I said, Sweetheart, I didn't steal your mats. My mom did. She cleaned them. And she's like, Stop it, Pop up. She's real quick. And I said, okay, sweetheart, that's fine. Just go ahead. She came in, she grabbed the mats, put them on her table. She sat back down. She's eating her little breakfast. And you know, she's got her little iPad on the table. Don't judge me because I let her have her iPad on the table because you do it too. So stop it. <laughs> so all of a sudden she stops and she looks at me and she goes, my iPad died, Papa. And so I looked at her and with all the love in my life, I said, that's because you accused me of stealing your mats. So that's what you get. And across the table, she gave me this look. And we had this little stare contest for just for a minute. And I thought she was going to cry. I, thought, I really thought I hurt her feelings because she's so emotional and so dramatic. And so I said, honey, don't cry. And she comes over to me. And she started wailing at me with both her hands. In love. In love, of course. But girls, I'll tell you what, girls, they're so different to raise and I've made my fair share of mistakes. How many fathers in the house have made their fair share of mistakes in raising their kids? I'll tell you what, they don't give us a manual when we leave the hospital with our children. They just, they don't. I wish they would. I wish they would, but they don't. But how, how, do, how many of you know that that's why it's so important for fathers to raise our children in the fear and the admonition of the Lord? That's critical. How are we supposed to know how to train up our children and raise our children if we're not looking in the book? 
We've got to look in the book. We've got to spend time with the Holy Spirit. We've got to intercede on behalf of our children. We've got to cry, it on, on, uh, cry out on behalf of our wives. We know that Proverbs 22 and 6 tells us, train up your child in the way that he should go, and when he or she is old, they will not depart from it. Well, how are we supposed to know the way that they're supposed to go if we don't take a look in the book? And don't leave that up to your wives, fathers. Don't leave. They do a good job. They do a good job of that, but it's time for the fathers to step it up. I hear so many stories of people saying, my, my mother prayed for me and my grandmother prayed for me. Well, praise God. It's about time we hear stories. My father prayed for me and my grandfather prayed for me, and that's why I'm saved today. And it's time for us to step it up. There's a, an author by the name of Paul Faulkner, and he wrote a book called Achieving Success Without Failing Your Family. Yeah. Mm. In the book, he shares these numbers. He says, if a mother goes to church, then 15, there's a 15% chance that her children will go to church later on when they're adults. If a father goes to church, then there's a 55% chance that his children will go to church when they're grown. But when the mother and the father lock arms together and they lead the family then there's a 72% chance that the children will go to church. So here's what I'm saying to you. Mothers, you are critically important. Papas, fathers, dads, you are critically important to the raising and the leading of your, of your children. You've got to lock arms together. You should not leave the responsibility as, of a dad to your wife. Don't do it. It's your job to step it up. Amen? I've heard it said like this, and I've heard Marilyn say this over the years, and it really affected my heart, and she, and she has said this, my father, she talks about her dad, my father was such a good dad, it was easy for me to love God, and it was easy to receive his love, God's love. That really affected me, growing up, raising children, because here it is, the way we raise our children, listen to me fathers, the way we raise our children is going to dictate the way they relate to God later on. So in other words, if you're harsh and mean and nasty, they're going to think God is harsh and mean and nasty. But if you're love and caring and nurturing and providing for them, then it's going to be easy for them to accept God's love because they received it from their earthly father. How critical is that? And we've made our mistakes. I've made my, my sh fair share of mistakes, but thank God for second chances, third chances, fourth, fourth chance. And we can always ask God for his grace to help us to raise our children to get better and to get better and to get better. My father and I, it wasn't the best relationship. It got better later on. He died of a massive stroke. I was able to lead him to the Lord before he passed away. But the thing that I say is that I wanted to be a better father than him. And I pray that my children will be better fathers than me so that we learn. We learn from their good and we learn from the not so good. Amen? I heard this little story. And it was about a father and a son who went fishing. And uh, when they returned home, the father was on the phone with his friend. And the son was on the phone with, with his little friend. You get the picture. You see what's happening here, right? And so the dad's friend asked the dad, and he said, hey, how, how was your fishing trip with your son? And this was the response of the dad. He said, it was absolutely miserable. It was the worst day of my life. We struggled getting the boat ready uh, to get on the lake, and then we had to get gas, and so we had to get back out of the water and get gas, and then we were late to get back on the water. All the good fishing spots, they were gone. And finally, when we found the place, the lines, they were all tangled together. And no matter what kind of bait I put out there, the fish weren't biting, and they were just nowhere to be found. Uh, the sun was hot. The mosquitoes were biting. We didn't catch a fish. It didn't catch a thing. It was miserable. Worst day of my life. The boys, the son's friend, asked the son, how was your fishing trip with your dad? And the son said this. He said, it was the best day of my life. It was hot and we didn't catch a thing, but I got to spend time alone with my dad. You know, dad, sometimes we focus on providing for our families and we should. That's important for us to do that. It's important for us to make sure that we're good providers. But sometimes the best thing that we can do for our children 
is just spend time with them. Just spend time with them. Just take a chance and sit and talk and be goofy. It doesn't have to be the big, I tried this in the beginning, the fatherly thing. We're going to have a family meeting. No, that, that doesn't work. But you just hang out together. You just hang out together. That's why, I mean, I don't like flying, but I love driving to Florida because you get them in the car for 20 hours and they can't run from you. You see, and you just talk and you can be goofy and you can just, even, even up to last night, I just love it. I've got a 23-year-old, almost 23-year-old, and a 21-year-old, and we're at home and oftentimes they come into the bed and just lay around and we just talk. And we're just goofy or we debate, just hanging out together with our children. Trust me, it's those memories that they will remember. Not all the expensive gifts, and they're nice, but more importantly, our memories. Amen? Amen? Amen. Let's stand together in the presence of the Lord as we read through some scripture this morning. I'm going to be speaking today on a, a very powerful account in the scriptures about a very powerful man. He was a man who was a leader, a man who was a ruler in the synagogue, a modern day pastor. He had influence, he had power, he had authority, but above all of that, he was a father. And as a father, he faced one of the most challenging things that a father could ever face. And that was the death of his daughter. And this account is found in three Gospels. It's found in Matthew and found in Mark and Luke. But I'm going to be reading today from the book of Mark, chapter 5, verses 22 through 43. So if you've got your devices, go ahead and get them. If you've got your paper Bibles, go ahead and get to Mark, chapter 5. 22 to 43. So I've got a download from heaven today. Are you ready for this? If you're ready, say, I'm ready. I'm ready. Hallelujah. Let's go ahead and let's read together. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and begged him earnestly saying, my little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed and she will live. So Jesus went with him and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I only touch his clothes, I shall be made well. And immediately the fountain of her, flood was dried, of her blood was dried up. And she felt in her body that she was healed of the affliction. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? But the disciples said to him, you see the multitude thronging you and you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see her who had done this thing but the woman fearing and trembling knowing what had happened to her came and fell before uh, fell down before him and told him the whole truth and he said to her daughter your faith has made you well go in peace and be healed of your affliction while he was still speaking some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said your daughter is dead why trouble the teacher anymore as soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken he said to the ruler of the synagogue do not be afraid only believe and, and he permitted no one to follow him except Peter James and John the brother of James then he came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw a tumult and those who wept and wailed loudly when he came in, he said to them, why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. They laughed at him. They mocked him. But when he had put them all outside, he took the father and the mother of the child and those who were with him and entered where the child was lying. Then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kumi, which is translated, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl arose and walked for she was 12 years of age and they were overcome with great amazement but he commanded them strictly that no one should know it and that and said that something should be given her to eat put your hand on your heart right now and father we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus and Lord we thank you for your word Holy Spirit I pray that you would speak to us you would bring revelation you would open up the scriptures to us, Father. You know where we are, Father. Meet us at our point of need, Father. Help us today. We need you. We're desperate for you. Have your way and do what only you can do. And if you believe that, say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. 
Hallelujah. You may be seated this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I told you I've got a little download from heaven. There's so much in these verses that, you, that, that we can go to, but I've got a few thoughts that I just want to go ahead and, and share with you today. But there is one thing, if there's anything that you leave here with today, and it is this. The words of Jesus himself. You didn't come to hear me. You didn't come to hear a worship team. You came to meet with Jesus. And this is what Jesus is saying in the house today. Do not be afraid. Just believe. Oh, but pastor, you don't know the situation that I'm facing. It's critical and things are horrible. Yes, I know. But Jesus says, do not be afraid. Just believe believe. Come on, turn to your neighbor and tell him, don't be afraid. Tell him, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, precious. Let's, let's unpack some of this. We're going to start right at, at Mark 5, 22 and 43, and we're just going to read through a couple things, and I'm going to share. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came. His name was Jairus by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet, and he begged them earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her that she may be healed, and she will live. Jairus' daughter was on the verge of death. She was very, very sick. I can't even begin to imagine my little 12 year old child on, on the verge of death and being sick. Although we face that while we were in Florida, our Jonah was on the verge of death. They gave me the report. He may not make it through the night. So I kind of understand what that feels like to some degree. But as fathers, we hate to see our children struggling. We hate to see them sick. And even I prayed this silly little prayer and hoping that God would answer. But I prayed when they've been sick, oh God, that you would take it away from them and put it on me. Because we just hate to see our kids sick. We suffer when our children suffer. Jairus was the ruler of the synagogue. He was a modern day pastor. He was a man of great authority and great power. He was a man who had influence. Everyone looked up to him. They respected him. He was a man of stature. But that didn't matter because Jairus was desperate. And apparently, all of his religion and all of his traditional beliefs did not have the answer to heal his daughter. He thought he could handle it maybe by himself, but he could not. And because Jairus was desperate, y'all, because he was desperate, it caused him to seek after Jesus. And Jairus sought after him with no shame. He didn't care what anybody said. He didn't care what anybody thought. He didn't care about his position. He didn't care about his denomination. He didn't care about anything. His stature, his influence, he was in a desperate situation. And I want to tell you today that desperate people do desperate things. Hallelujah. Sometimes Jesus will allow us to get to the end of our rope, to the end of our understanding, to the end of our own intelligence, the end of our own money, the end of our own capabilities, so that we recognize that we are in absolute 1,000% desperate need of him. Why do we always wait for a tragedy to seek after Jesus radically? Why do we wait for something bad to happen in our lives before we come to church? Why do we do that? Why not try to stay in a position with Jesus, with God, with the Holy Spirit at all times where we're saying, oh God, I need you desperately, even though things look like they're going good, but oh God, I need you desperately because God, I woke up this morning. I woke up this morning and you gave me breath. Oh God, I woke up this morning and you let me see. Oh God, I woke up this morning and you let me hear. Oh God, I'm breathing today, the breath of life. I'm desperate for you. Let him stop the air for, for two seconds and see if you're not crying out to Jesus this morning. Hallelujah. Stay in that place of desperation for him. Don't wait till something happens. Be prepared. Take the offense. Be ready for things. Jesus should always strive to be desperate for God. See, Jairus needed a miracle and he knew he couldn't do it. So he had heard about this, this Jesus, and he went out to Jesus. He knew there was no one else who could help his precious little 12-year-old daughter, his princess. The darling of the family, because she was dying. Did you notice Jairus did not send his wife? Jairus didn't send his siblings? Jairus didn't send his other children? 
Jairus didn't send the servants. The man of the house went out and sought Jesus on behalf of his family. He himself, he didn't say, hey wife, you go ahead and you do this. The man, the father took his role, his godly role, and went out and went after Jesus. And men, we are to do the same. We are to partner with our wives. As they pray, we pray. We lead. We lead the family. We lead our children. We'll do things for our children we won't even do for ourselves. You've been there? It's important that we intercede for our children. It's important that we do those things for our kids. Listen, we've got our children's hearts in our hands. God has entrusted your children into your care. He's entrusted your wife, your helpmate, into your hands. And that's not for you to hold on to it like a controller. That's so we can say, Jesus, hear the hearts of my children. Jesus, here, here, here's my wife's heart. I, you know, I love them, but, but I'm limited. I'm limited to what I can do for them. But Jesus, I know that you can do everything for them. And I want to introduce you to my family, Jesus. I, I, want, I want to bring you to my house. Jesus, I want you to, to see who my wife is. I want you to introduce my children to, to you. Lord, Jesus, here, here are my children. And here's my wife. And Jairus wasn't ashamed to invite Jesus into his home in front of the multitude of people. Look at the picture. See, I'm artsy. I'm artsy. So I see these, these pictures in my head. The crowd of people around Jesus thronging, the word thronging, trying to touch him and all pushing up against him. Multitude of people. And here's this man of influence who humbles himself, doesn't care about anything, gets down on his feet. Oh, Jesus, come into my house. We need you. We need a miracle. My daughter is dying. And he was not ashamed in front of people to, uh, first of all, to acknowledge his need and then invite Jesus to the home. We as fathers should be doing the same. Be an example to our wives. Be an example to our children. You want your wife to really uh, start looking at you kind of flirtatious again? Take that role as a father and a husband. And she'll start winking her eyes at you again. Trust me, she will. Okay, we'll, we'll just move on from that. Three of you got that, so it's all good. Hallelujah. I'm looking for the real people. Are there real people in the house? I'm looking for those. Amen. So we go back to verse 24 and it says, so Jesus went with him. Man, Jesus went with him and a great multitude followed him and, and thronged him. Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians who had spent all that she had and was no better but rather grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment for she said, if I only may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. He invited Jesus, and Jesus said, yes. Jesus wants to come into your home. He wants to be a part of your life. He wants to be a part of your children, your wife. He just wants an invitation. Invite him in. Let him do what only he can do. See, but Jesus didn't just go to Jairus' house because he came with the need. Jesus understands our need. He already knows what we have need of before we even know we have need of it. He already knows. He already knows that we hurt. He understands our hurt because he went through hurt while he was here on earth. But do you want to know why I believe he went with Jairus? He went with Jairus because Jairus was a man of faith. Not only did he state what the situation is, because listen, precious, our faith does not neglect reality. So the reality was my daughter is dying. But here's what he said by faith. But you will come and lay your hands on her and she will live. Faith. And Jesus was impressed by faith. It's only by faith that we can please God. Hallelujah. So he went. Jesus went to Jairus' house. He wants to be with us. He wants to do all those great things in your life and in my life. Just, will we let him in? I mean, really let him in? Every part of our lives, every part of our children's life, all the ugliness, all the mess, all the embarrassing things that we go through with our kids, all the embarrassing things that we go through with our marriages, are we ready to let Jesus really come in? I pray that we are. So there they are. Picture this. The huge crowd, Jesus in the middle. There's Jairus. Oh, he must have been elated. 
elated. I remember when they told me my son, they thought they had, that he had cancer while we were in Florida. Five days later, while he's in the hospital, the doctor came back and said, no cancer. He's, he's good. And so I was elated. I mean, you, you had to scrape me off the ceiling. I was so excited about my son not having cancer. And, and uh, so I, I could imagine Jairus thinking, yes, my daughter's sick, but Jesus is coming and he's going to heal her because I have faith. Call the wife, clean the house, get some food on. Jesus is coming. He's coming. But then, say but then, the picture kind of changes a little bit. In the middle of walking towards Jairus' house, the crowd stops. I don't know that Jairus knew what was happening. The crowd was so big. But we see, we see in the scriptures that this woman came along with her own faith, fell at the feet of Jesus, touched his garment, and was immediately healed. So we see that in verse 29. Immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up. She fell in her body. She was healed of the affliction. And Jesus immediately, knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched me? But the disciples, now there's another version that said it was, it was Peter that said to Jesus, and I, I can see that big mouth Peter said to Jesus, are you kidding me? Look at all the people around you, Jesus. Right, Greg? Who, who, everybody's touching you. But you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened, came and fell down before him and told, catch this, told him, Jesus, the whole truth. And he said, Jesus said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Be healed of your affliction. Awesome. Praise God. We've heard a million sermons on that. Now, please forgive me. If, if, if I'm being a little goofy, I don't want to offend anybody. But here, here's my take on this. She told Jesus the whole story. Now, you got to imagine, Jairus is now waiting. What is he thinking? What does he think? My daughter is on the verge of death. Jesus was on his way. She was going to be healed. But now we've stopped because this woman has just messed everything up. But Jairus was patient. He stood there. And now she's telling him, she's telling Jesus everything that happened. Now we know that it's a fact that women talk more than men. <laughs> now, unless you're me, because I'm RT, because I'm RT, I talk more. I actually talk more than my wife. It's just, I'm RT, my mind's constantly going. And so I could imagine she's telling him the story. Well, Jesus, I was born on this day and I was born over here and my mother is and my father is, and then I got sick, and then I ended up going to this doctor over here, but he was a quack, he charged me too, too much money. But then I went over to this doctor, and I saw Mary at the doctor's office, but you know, she's having trouble with her husband, and her kids are like demonized, and there's real some issues going on there. But then it didn't work, so three weeks later, I had to go, and so she's telling him the story. And Jairus is there, patiently waiting. We don't know how long it was, but all I know, it tells me that she told him the whole story, so she's talking, <laughs> telling him the story. If it would have been a man, it would have been, Jesus, I was sick, you healed me, praise God, I'm out. <laughs> Not me. I would have been long-winded. But, but it would have been five seconds flat for the man. Okay, so you've got to try to understand what's happening. Put yourself, I try to put myself, when I read the scriptures, I try as much as I can to put myself in their shoes. Okay, sometimes that's not really good, but I did in this case. And so I'm thinking about what Jairus must be thinking, but he stood there. As far as we know, he stood there patiently. Jairus is waiting. Let me ask you a question. And I'm asking this to the real people, not to the religious people. How do you react when you have to wait? You can adjust your halo later. You know what I can't stand? I can't stand going to Walmart and waiting in those lines. I hate waiting in those lines. And you know what's even worse is when you're like 15 people deep and you're in the back and they've got 25 stinking registers there but only two are open. And listen, I'm not dogging any Walmart employees. It's not your fault. I know it's whatever. I'm not dogging you, okay? But you're there waiting. You're trying to be patient. And you're trying to be nice because, you know, you're a Christian and people know you. 
And so you don't want to give a bad witness or a bad testimony. Come on, all the real people in the house. That happened to me a long time ago. I went off the bonkers on my kids at a store years ago. And out of the, the, the other lane, a brother in the church came by and said, are you okay, Tony? And I'll never do that again. <laughs> I mean, I lost it on them. It, they were being goofy. Anyway, so you're waiting in those lines and they start talking. The workers start talking to each other, complaining about their manager. Or worse, you're waiting in line and you're waiting, you're being patient, you're smiling, you're trying to be encouraging, Jesus help me. Jesus help me, how it's smiley. And then all of a sudden, there's a price check needed. You've been there, you've been there. Oh, Jesus. Oh, you're at the doctor's office. And they, they get you there at 9.15, but they scheduled five people for 9.15. And you're there to 12. You're almost dead by the time they finally see you. Or stopping at the red light. I know one of the biggest, I love Florida. We loved our time in Florida. But the driving there, it just, I would lose my mind every time I was on the road. They're so slow. And so God was really helping me, and my wife was really helping me. Thank God I didn't know people there in Florida. But anyway, here's the thing. How do we respond? How do you respond when Jesus doesn't answer your prayer right away? How do you respond when you've asked Jesus to heal you or your family member and you've been praying and you've been fasting, you've been going after God, you've been, you've been, uh, you've humbled yourself and you're seeking God radically and you're in a position of desperation and then you read on Facebook where somebody else got their breakthrough. And you'll go ahead and you'll press like, mm-hmm. <laughs> Where are the real people? Talking to the real people. It doesn't feel good to wait. Why did Jesus make Jairus wait? It doesn't make sense. His daughter is dying. He humbled himself. Why do we have to wait sometimes? It just doesn't make sense. And I believe Jesus made Jairus wait because he was working out something in his heart. There was something greater, and this, this is not going to make sense, but I think, I think you'll understand what I'm saying. There was something deeper that needed to be worked out in Jairus more important than Jesus and just healing the daughter first. Jesus already knew he was going to heal her. But there was something he needed to work out in the dad. There was something that he wanted to teach him. And listen, I'll tell you what, nobody likes to wait. I was in a year of waiting in Florida. Not fun. One of the greatest challenges of my life, but one of the greatest seasons of my life. And we know that there is a purpose in our waiting. We don't like it. Oh, we'll come to church and we'll, we'll praise the bricks right off the, 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 the walls in praise and worship. But when it gets to waiting, we really struggle with that. But let me tell you, let me just read to you. And I know you know this portion of scripture. Oh, but those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. There is purpose in our waiting. He's working something out. And so that's what I believe. Jesus was working something out in Jairus. Because he loved Jairus just as much as he loved his daughter. Hmm. Help us to learn to wait, Lord. Help us to learn to wait. Maybe Jesus wanted Jairus to see the miracle of the lady. Maybe he thought Jairus' faith needed, needed to be built up just a little more. Maybe it was this. You know, Jairus, you're a man of authority. You're a man of power. You, you tell people what to do and they do it. You're very, very well respected. What you say goes and you tell people what to do. But Jairus, I want you to know that, and I'm not being offensive here, but back in the culture of those days, women were kind of looked down upon. They were less than outcasts. So this, but this woman over here, she's a woman, number one, but now she's an outcast because she's uh, having an issue with blood, so she's considered unclean. Jairus, I want you to know that I love her as much as I love you and your daughter. And I want you to know that you and this woman, you're equal to me. And I'm not going to do things the way you think I'm going to do them. I'm going to do things, Jesus is saying, I'm going to do things the way I know is best. And so I'm going to stop here and let you know that I love my precious daughter. 
You may not have regard for her. You may not have respect for her. You may not have honor for her, but I'm going to show this crowd, this is how we honor women. And I'm going to heal her and I'm going to touch her. And then he called her daughter. Wow. He called her daughter and healed her. So Jairus is there waiting. Sometimes makes you want to cuss when you wait. Yeah. I'm not talking about real cussing. I'm not talking about real cussing. I'm talking about cartoon cussing. Have you ever just won a cartoon crust? Rack 'em, frack 'em, shake 'em, mech 'em. You just, and those aren't tongues, that's cartoon cuss. Just saying. But don't do that, don't, don't cuss, that, that would not be nice. But we don't know how long this conversation was happening, and Jairus is there waiting. And in verse 35, it says this. While he was still speaking, this is Jesus, some came from the ruler of the synagogue's house who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher anymore? Really? Uh, Jesus, are you kidding me? I, I, I put myself in Jairus' shoes. I humbled myself before you. I've done everything that I know to do I humiliated myself in my hometown before the people that look up to me. I sought after you. I fell on my face. I worshiped you. I honored you. I invited you into my home. And you let my daughter die? Maybe he could have said, Jesus, that woman with the issue of blood, she had it for 12 years. She could have waited one more day. <laughs> Think about it. You laugh, but we say that. Why does it always seem at times, that everybody else's prayers get answered but mine or yours? Why does it seem that the struggle is so real in my life, yet somebody else gets the breakthrough? And I want to be happy for them really sincerely. I want to rejoice with them. And I think you want to rejoice with them too. But you question, Lord, and I know what it is to wait. I know when my wife and I were going through the struggle with, with, with her illness for 20 years, I waited. 20 years, you want to talk about the challenge, the questions, the wanting to quit, the questioning Jesus? Lord, I'm your worship leader. You use me in powerful ways. I bless others. I encourage others. Can't you do this one thing for me and heal my wife? I think that's a reasonable question. I think it's a reasonable request. But he's not going to do it my way. There were things that I needed to learn. There were things that he had to deal with in my heart. There were things he needed to deal with my wife in her heart. And it just happened. When I least expected it, I was still in faith. But you kind of, after a while, you're like, okay, maybe. You know, you know sometimes <clears throat> you can be so unhealthy that you forget what healthy feels like. So you learn to accept something that is not of God. And we had a speaker here Sunday night, and she put it in a perspective that has rocked my life. She said, you can adjust to your situation, but never accept nothing but God's promises. <clears throat> never accept. But one day, she went to bed sick, like what she had done for 20 years. But the next morning, she woke up 100% well. 100% well. Jesus had visited our house and had touched my wife. And, it said, and you know, instead of saying, arise, little girl, it was arise, as anacado. And she did. And to, from that day to this, she's been amazing. Praise God for that. But I've been there. I've been there. I've been in that waiting place that's not comfortable. But what do you do in that waiting place? You stay in faith and you do what you know is right. You do what you know is right. You don't run. You don't look for other people's opinions. You don't go running around from church to church. You don't talk about anybody. You just do what you know is right. You worship. You go after Jesus. Come on, precious. That's what we do. That's what we do. But they told him. They told him. And maybe there's people around you that tell you, uh, you know, um, don't bother Jesus anymore. That Jesus thing, it doesn't work. There's nothing more he can do. He didn't help you to begin with. Why are you going to seek after him anyway? 
Why are you wasting your time on this Jesus thing? Jairus, you should have just stayed with your daughter. You should let your wife go and, and find Jesus and look after Jesus. Maybe depending on Jesus and trusting him is an absolute waste of time. And Jairus could have said, Jesus, you were just too late. You were walking with me and you stopped for that woman. Why did you do that? And I can hear Mary and Martha when their brother Lazarus died and he was in the tomb for four days and he was already decomposing and smelling and Jesus showed up late, what they thought was late, asking him and telling him, Jesus, if you were only here four days ago, my brother would have lived. Jesus, if you just would have kept walking and gone to my house, my daughter would have been alive. You could have dealt with that lady later, tomorrow. Jesus, thank you, but no thank you. But I've come to tell you today, don't stop bothering Jesus. We're not bothering Jesus. Don't stop knocking on his door. Don't stop seeking after him. Don't stop interceding for your children. I don't care what it looks like. I don't care how the people are judging you. I don't care how the people are judging you, the way you parent. I don't care what your child is doing. I don't care what your wife is doing. Keep knocking. Keep interceding. And don't let the opinions of people who don't know anything better in their life to deter you from seeking after God. Amen. Don't let that happen. Amen. Don't let that happen. And just on a side note, here's what I've learned. I'm 50 years old now. I'm wearing readers, which I don't like. But here's the thing. I've raised four boys. One thing I've learned, do not judge other people's children. Because your little precious Sally and little precious Bobby at five years old that you can control, oh, baby girl, they're going to grow up. And they're going to be teenagers. My precious brother, you can judge me about what my kids did. And let me tell you something. I'll be the first one to tell you, my kids embarrassed us. My kids did some things that really, I went, oh, Jesus, I hope nobody knows about that one. Because that's really, that's really bad. They did some things that we're not proud of. They did things that they're not proud of. And people judged us. And people judge our parenting and the things that we did. And it's those same people that 10 years later when their little precious Bobby grew up were doing worse things than my kids. But here's what I did. All right, truth time, right? Truth, let's be real. I wanted to laugh. I wanted to laugh and say, see, I told you. But what I did, I went up to those parents and I embraced them. And I said, it's gonna be okay. My kids did some things, your kids do some things. Never put your kid on a pedestal. Just don't do it. They're going to embarrass you. They're going to do some things you're not proud of. So, all right, that was just a little side note. Don't, don't, don't judge other people's, other people's kids because it's going to come back to you. <clears throat> Verse 36 says, And so as soon as Jesus heard the word that was being spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not be afraid. Only believe and he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. See, I love this because Jesus can multitask. He was talking to the lady, but he heard this negative report over here. And he stopped it right away and he turned and he said, don't believe that mess. I'm with you. Don't be afraid. Keep believing. He didn't want Jairus to get into his emotions. How many of you know we get into our emotions? Our heart above all things will lie to us. It is evil. We get into our emotions and it will lie to us. We are not to be people led by our emotions. And Jesus did not want Jairus to get caught up with his emotion. Now imagine you're told your child just died. How can you not get caught up in your emotion? But Jesus said, just don't be afraid. Believe. And I've come all the way from Palm Coast and now New Jersey to tell somebody in this house, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Just believe. I know the situation looks bad. I know you've been judged. I know that it looks like it's dead, but I'm telling you, let Jesus in. Don't be afraid. Just believe. Now, the interesting thing. The interesting thing was that when they finally did go to Jairus' house, Jesus did not let the people, the crowd, come with him. He let them see the miracle of the woman, but then he said, no, no, no. Now it's just me, James, Peter, and John, and Jairus. And I thought about that. I said, 
if you're going to show the people a miracle, come on, resurrect somebody. That is some major time stuff, right? But then I thought about it, and the Holy Spirit said to me, Tony, there are some things that the people around you cannot handle. There are some miracles that are going to happen in your life that people cannot be a part of. They may be negative. They're critical. They, they have their own. And you cannot mix doubt and faith together. They could not handle what was going to happen over here. Sometimes, listen, you just got to say, bye, Felicia. I got to cut you off. I can't do it. Okay? Sometimes you just got to say, listen, I love you. I'm not saying to hate people, but you got to just say, hey, listen, I just got to move on without you because this thing, this journey that I'm on, I can't have this negativity. I can't have, I can't have this criticism. Just can't do it. Jesus tells us in Hebrews 12 and 2 to fix our eyes upon him, the author and the finisher of our faith. We get into these things. We got to fix our eyes upon Jesus. Don't be afraid, Jairus. Just believe. And they went. He didn't allow the crowd to come. And they get closer to the house and closer to the house. And Jesus is hearing all this wailing, all this crying, all this mourning. And the scripture uses a word that intrigued me. And it said it was a, a, a tumult. Then he came into the house of the ruler. We're reading from uh, verse 38. Then he came into the house of the ruler of the synagogue and saw a tumult. And those who wept and they wailed loudly. When he came in and he said to them, why make this commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but she's sleeping. They ridiculed him. But when he had put them, I love this. Jesus was no joke. When he put them all outside, he took the father and the mother and the, uh, the mother of the child and those who were with him, Peter, James, and John, and he entered into the room where the child was lying. That word tumult is a very interesting word. As I looked up, as I looked it up and studied it, tumult, first of all, the sound that was there was weeping and wailing. Their emotions got in the way of them to be able to receive any faith. Okay? But tumult means, uh, it means loud, confused noise. Confusion and disorder. And I thought about that. And here's what, yeah, this is what I, this is what I, what I believe the Holy Spirit told me, he said, right before your greatest breakthrough, right before your greatest miracle, the enemy is going to come at you with some confusion and disorder. And alongside of the enemy, it's going to be sometimes even be your spouse, even be your children, sometimes even be your best friends. Why are you, why are you holding on to faith? Why are you believing? Why are you praying? Why are you going to that church? Why are you giving? All they want is your money. All they want from you, that's all they want. Why are you doing all these things? And you, it's going to be confusion. You're going to feel disorder. But know that that's not of God. God, even in the midst of our trial, is a God of order. And he's a God of peace. That's why we know about supernatural peace. The peace that surpasses human understanding. Because even in the greatest trials and tragedies, you can stand strong. You don't have to give in to the emotion. He's a God of peace. He's a God of order. And I love that Jesus is no joke. I mean, he's merciful and kind, but he's a man's man, and he knew how to get, rid of, get out. Bye, Felicia. You got to go. You got to go. I love you, but I love you from a distance. I'm not going to hate you. I'll help you. I'll talk to you. But you cannot be a part of this journey with me. Just can't. And so he threw the people out. He wasn't going to tolerate confusion and disorder. Don't tolerate confusion and disorder. Especially when it comes to your household. Protect your household. Protect your wife, fathers and men. Protect your children. Protect them. Look after them. Because if you don't, somebody else might try to. Don't allow anyone to compromise your faith. So they went into that room armed with just the words of Jesus. Don't be afraid. Just believe. They had nothing else. 
And sometimes you know when you're going through your mess, and I'm going through my mess, all you have are the words of Jesus. But I want you to know that that's more than enough. And I remember all the prophetic words I received and all the great things I received about me and my wife. And I would just, I write them down. And in those times of just a low place, I read them over and over to build my faith. To build my faith. Because if there's anyone that I want to believe, it's Jesus. And his words for me. So they knew, all they knew, not to be afraid. Just believe so they walk into the room, says that Jesus touched the little girl, touched her. I could, I, I could just imagine how gentle that was. I said, little girl, arise. And you know, sometimes we go through some really difficult things. And if there's anything you're going to learn about me is that I want to be as real and transparent because we live in a very real world with real issues. We should not be afraid of them, but we should have answers for everything. But I know that things can look dead. Things were really looked at like there's no hope. My marriage is over. Looks like we're headed for divorce. My children are acting out. My finances, things in the church, things with my family, my job, just look miserable. All it will take is for you to invite Jesus in. Let the waiting process happen. Just wait and let him put his hands. And he said, little girl. She was 12 years old. She was a little girl. But she wasn't like a little girl, like my granddaughter, four years old. But here's what I think when I think about that. When we put everything into perspective of how Jesus looks at our issues, they're little to him. Think about it. Not that he doesn't care, but they're little. If you're up on an airplane, you look out little houses, little people, but they're really real. But it's your perspective, right? I can hear Jesus just saying, you know, to that problem, that little problem in your marriage, stop, arise in the marriage, arise in your healing, arise with your children, little this, little that, arise, arise. And Jesus putting his hands on your marriage, putting his, his hands on your spouse, putting his hands on that situation that you're so ashamed of or you just feel so worthless over. Just invite him in. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Jesus triumphs over death. And I will tell you this. I don't care what anybody says to me. It is not over until God says it's over. <laughs> so then at the end of the story, we hear Jesus saying, give her some food. And my natural side says, yeah, Jesus is all about food. I love food too. It's all good. <laughs> uh, but I think what he's telling us there is now that I've, now that I've completed the miracle, Take care and nourish the thing that I've done in your life. Protect it. Protect it. Feed yourself well and don't go back to that place where you were. Everything you can. Now that I've touched you. Now that I've touched your marriage. Now that I've healed you. Now that I've saved your children. Now that I've... Now protect it. Fathers, protect it. Protect your, protect your wives. Protect your children. And these are my last thoughts. To me... I love the women. I love the mamas. We're so grateful for the mothers. But to me, there's nothing greater that touches my heart than a man or a father that will fight for his family. And I'm not talking about physical fight, although sometimes you got to do that too. But I'm talking, I'm talking about, no, you got to do what you got to do, protect your woman and your kids. You know what I'm saying? But I'm talking about spiritually. I'm talking about who will go in and is not ashamed to pray for his wife. Not a shame. One thing that I want to get better at, and I'm just going to be real vulnerable and transparent here. One of the things that Azan and I started doing this year that we never did is to pray for one another. Literally, she lays her hands on me every day and she anoints me with oil. Every day. 
And I'm getting better at trying to pray for her when she does that. There's, there's an intimacy there. There's something so good there that I can protect her and she can protect me. We pray for our kids. You know the kids get goofy sometimes, but we pray for our kids. So much so that Maya, little four-year-old Maya, will come to us sometimes and lay her hands on us. And she'll go, shh, 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 but she'll lay her hands on us. <laughs> now that's cute, but that's the example. And I'm not lifting us up. Listen, it's taken, we've been together almost 30 years. Okay, almost 30 years. So I'm saying, you can do those things. Pray with them. I know it can be a little awkward, but do it. A man who's willing to fight for his children spiritually, for his home. Fathers, there will be a time when you will need to believe for your children and your wife at times where they will not be capable of doing it for themselves. You're the dad. You're the husband. You need to step up, step up to the plate of faith. Fight off fear. Ignore negative people. Get them out of there. Negative words and criticisms. Because people only see one little chapter of your life and they want to label you. Well, I tell them, read the next chapter because that's where I get victory. You know what I'm saying? There's another chapter coming. There's another chapter coming. You only see with your eyes what, what's in the natural, but God is supernatural and he knows the next chapter of my life. Don't be afraid. Just believe. It's not over until God says it's over. Jairus was the hero. He brought Jesus home, introduced his family to Jesus. Jesus, have your way with my daughter. Have your way with my wife. Fill them up. Love them. Build them up. Save them. But it was his responsibility as the head of the home to do that. I've been called a lot of things. I have titles. Worship leader, pastor, reverend, and all. And, and that's all fine. That's all good. I'm not, I'm not into titles. That's fine. The greatest thing that I can be called is dad. That is the most precious. Greg and I had a conversation about that. that's the most precious thing that your little girl, your little boy can call you. Even today when I get, a, I got a text from my oldest son, dad, I love you so much. Happy Father's Day. Dad, that's just precious. I saw Chris up here this morning with his, I think his little boy. And the little boy just wrapping his arms around his dad. And I just thought, how precious is that? Fathers, it's time for us to take our place again. Mamas, thank you for what you've done. Thank you for stepping in because many fathers have failed to take our rightful place. But I pray that this house of men will be men that know how to step into their role as a father and as dads. Amen? Amen? Come on, if you believe that, if you agree with that, give the Lord a mighty clap offering this morning. Come on, give him some praise in the house. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. We bless you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.